So really my first three, four, five months, I was busy learning how to detect fraud. About six months into my job, uh, I reached out to my uh, manager and I told him, listen, I'm working about 400 to 500 alerts per day. I'm making in real time between 400, 500, 600 decisions. Do I stop a credit card? Do I call the customer? And 80% of the time, our rules not catching fraud. Why we have such a high false positive? And my manager, uh, being Israeli with a very straight up approach, told me, you think you can do a better job? From now, you are the person responsible for writing the rules. Uh, so uh, eight months uh, later, uh, I was actually the person who writing and dictating the whole fraud uh, strategy for the company. And ever since then, 14 years, uh, that's what I've been doing. About eight years ago, I relocated to the United States and really shifted from fraud operation and analytics to consulting. So I spent my first five years in the US working uh, with traditional banks, you know, cities, the Wells Fargo's, the Bank of America's, consulting them on how to create the right fraud strategy and how to place right fraud controls. Uh, and then I decided it's my time to move to FinTech. That's where uh, the opportunity with Lilly came. I was one of the first employees at Lilly. And there I really had the first time the opportunity to create my fraud strategy from scratch. Thinking about coming to a company who scaling insanely fast and the only fraud tool that you have at your disposal is your Oracle SQL. So you can write SQL queries all day long, but that's all you have. Six months into my uh, position as a head of fraud uh, and risk at Lilly, I reached out to the co-founders and told them, guys, we are scaling fast. We have almost 300,000 customers. I can no longer keep writing SQLs. Uh, we need some tool to automate uh, the whole process and have the alerts coming to me instead of me keep writing the same queries over and over and over again. And that's where my journey of looking for a fraud vendor started. And I ended up choosing Unit 21. Um, for several reasons, I think the reason I chose Unit 21 was, first of all, the ease of implementation. From my personal experience working with legacy vendors where implementing a fraud solution can take anywhere between three, six months, sometimes one year, uh, I was able to implement Unit 21 within eight weeks with the help of two engineers. And exactly. Um, but also, what I really like about Unit 21 is the approach to fighting fraud. I had all the data that I needed to fight the fraud. I just didn't have the tool. And that's what Unit 21 provided me. It provided me the perfect platform to ingest my old data, to ingest my old risk signals that I already have from different vendors, and create my own strategy with a very flexible root engine. Uh, and pretty much like Trisha said, uh, two years later, uh, Trisha convinced me to join Unit 21. And today, I'm the head of fraud risk over here. And thank you, Alex, for sharing that. We're super, super excited and thrilled to have uh, have someone like Alex who really gets what um, what the problems in fraud are. So it's this is a pattern that we see a lot. You know, companies start with SQL queries, spreadsheets, screenshots. That's their fraud strategy: is write SQL and figure it out. And then they move to maybe, you know. The next level is a level where you're maybe getting a risk score and you have some in-house tools, some degree of automation. But level three is really what you talked about, which is how do you get more data into the picture? How can you tap into the versatility of your data? And um, how do you enable more automation so you can spend more time on detection? But that shift from like a fraud detection standpoint to a fraud prevention standpoint is a really big shift for a company. How did you convince and build a case internally that we need to move towards a fraud prevention and not a very reactive fraud detection? So I, I think traditionally 
mm-hmm. we've been chasing fraud uh, all the time. So with with legacy tools that we have 10, 15 years ago, those were our capabilities. We didn't have uh, any other way. So you will have the operations team detect the fraud, uh, transfer the cases to the analytics team who will do analysis, which usually will take a few days, one week, two weeks, maybe a month, depending on how big is the case. And once they understand the fraud pattern, they will build a use case for that and transfer it to the engineers who will take some time to implement that new control for the fraud operations to start working on it. So the whole cycle was very slow and it was reacting to fraud. And in many cases, by the time you finished, you're done reacting, it's already too late. The fraud shifted, the fraud evolved, and you need to come up with a new strategy. And I think this is why it's so critical to have a platform that allows you to streamline this circle between fraud operations, fraud analytics, and you actually don't need engineers anymore because a good platform will empower both your operational team and your analytics team. So your operational team will detect the fraud. They can escalate the cases immediately within the same platform to the analytics team who can review the cases and write rules that address that problem on the same day, validate the rules on the same day, and deploy them into production, everything in the same day. So the reaction, the cycle is much faster. So now you're not only detecting fraud, you're actually preventing it. Because if you're acting fast enough and you deploy a new strategy, a new, con- a new control fast enough, that's where you start to prevent the fraud. Yeah, that's the agility and the speed to response is really where you go from fraud detection to genuine proactive fraud prevention. I'm curious, you know, one thing that always really struck me about how Alex approached different, how Alex approached fraud at Lilly was he was one of the first people who showed us what Unit 21 could be leveraged for which we did not imagine when we started the company. And one of the things that you did was you leveraged very different types of data. You would send us login data and you know a lot of different types of user actions. I'm curious, that, that's a very big departure from traditional fraud where it's like, okay, send me your transaction, I'll give you a score. How did you think of, okay, I have this unique types of data sets, let me leverage it all? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, traditionally, we were monitoring transactions. Even the tool is called transaction monitoring. So we will look at the financial data and try to understand whether or not a specific transaction or set of transactions are uh, suspicious or fraudulent. But the financial industry changed so much in the past two decades. And we have to take into consideration all the different elements that we have today. and we need to start collecting risk signals from the very first interaction with a prospect, when when they're not even a customer, when they just start the onboarding journey, and really take all those signals into consideration and combine them with the financial activity that those customers uh, do to create much more sophisticated strategy. Um, Also, many of my colleagues believe that a good approach fighting fraud today is to have a hybrid solution where you have on one side a good transaction monitoring and a good uh, and flexible rule engine to write your strategy, but also uh, don't don't ignore uh, machine learning and AI capabilities. And like you said, if you have the opportunity to generate risk scores, either for entities or for transactions, uh, you should incorporate those in your fraud strategy. Your, your utility and, and the way that you use data is so unique that we started really incorporating that into how, how we think about fraud as well. I'm curious, so when you're you know, a young, Lily is one of the fastest growing fintech companies now at a million active users. I'm curious, how do the KPIs change that you are measuring? You started, when we first met you, you were, I think, a team of two and then it, it grew. How did you measure the effectiveness of the general program? KPIs are different from one company to another. Uh, I I think for me, it was around how much effort and how much time and how much, what is the cost for me to fight fraud? 
on one hand. And on the other side, I take approach to fighting fraud not from a place where I fear the fraud. I approach fighting fraud from a place where I try to create as much enablement for my good customers. So my, my whole strategy is, first of all, to, have, to make sure that the good customers still have a good journey. Uh, that, no, I'm not, limit, not limiting them too much. I'm not creating too much uh, friction, either in onboarding on, or when they do transaction or when they try to look into the app. So that was my, th th those were my KPIs. And, 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 and I think this approach is, is it's really new because traditional banking really looked at the transactional part of things. And also, obviously, banks always were sensitive about, you know, declining cards and, you know, having a bad customer experience. But now it's, it's not only the transaction, it, it, the features on the app, it's what you can do. So th those were my KPIs at Lilly. And, and, and I feel like when I see our customers at Unit21, I feel like this is, this is pretty much the new standard. Uh, I think many fintechs and crypto companies really try to make sure that the holistic experience from the moment that the applicant wants to onboard the platform and then use the platform, they try to maximize the way and obviously also to reduce fraud losses. Yeah, it's such an interesting point that, you know, ultimately you're not just looking to stop fraud, but you're also looking to have a good experience for your good customers. And I keep joking that the best way to solve fraud is to not have customers. You're not going to have a fraud problem, which, of course, fraud is such a key integral part to the overall business growth. And fraud can unlock business growth in, in really interesting ways, because if you have a really strong fraud strategy, you can open up into new markets. And, you know, a testament to what Alex said was that Lily has is adding new markets and new verticals that they are targeting new types of users and they're able to move very quickly because of the kind of infrastructure that Alex set up. The last question that I have for you, Alex, is what is, what is the most interesting trend in fraud right now? What, what should people be aware of? How should people think of, okay, this is what I need to look for. These are the types of people I need to hire for um, in order to make sure that we don't have massive fraud losses. So I, I think the way fraud is trending today, it's on one side, um, fraud is very instant because payments became very instant. Uh, you have all the P2P solutions who enable you to transfer money from uh, one entity to another within seconds. And obviously with fast payments come fast fraud. But also we're seeing, uh, and especially now after the pandemic, a lot of uh, what we call old school and traditional fraud is coming back uh, simply because we have so many people who chose uh, that fraud is the right way for them to live during the pandemic. And they took advantage of all the different uh, incentives that the government provided during the pandemic. But now when it's over, they still want to do fraud. So we see traditional fraud, especially around ACH and mobile check deposits. So I, I think those are the two, the two elements that we're seeing this year. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Alex. It's, uh, it's been great to, you know, first to work with you as a partner and, and now to actually continue to build Unit21 with you. Uh, so thank you for sharing your thoughts and your journey. Thank you. So Alex, I've watched a couple of the, um, uh, I forget the title right the second, but the recent uh, videos you've done, they've been fascinating and super educational, so appreciate that. Uh, a lot of what you've talked about has been leveraging the data you have to inform the different things that you can do to detect fraud. What advice would you give to a company that doesn't have data yet because they don't have customers yet in terms of setting their initial controls until they have the data to look at retroactively that, that that's a good question and we actually meet a lot of uh, customers who are just getting started uh, fintech companies and crypto companies who just got funded and they're really thinking okay what is the right way what is the right approach i think no matter what vendor you choose make sure that the vendor gives you as much insight as they can to why they scores certain things to why they make certain things appear risky. 
Because if you have those in insights, if you have the data behind it, you can run your own analysis. And when you run your own analysis, you can understand what is relevant for your customer base. So, you know, the first 1,000, 5,000, 100,000 customers, you will be able to do your own analytics and understand which risk factors are relevant for you and your company. Hi, my name is Amit. Uh, I worked at LinkedIn Fraud. Uh, given that abuse is like omnipresent across the world, right? And it's always similar set of malicious entities involved in fraud, be it Facebook, WhatsApp, finance fraud. Uh, how do you convince companies to give you data? I mean, firstly, there are so many regulations, GDPR, EII data. And do you guys leverage signals across the company to get the score, right? And giving a score again is just a Boolean or a, like a range. What happens when companies start asking you uh, the algorithm behind it? Like, can we really trust your score? And I just wanted to understand how Unit 21 handles this kind of stuff. You want to think? Yeah, that's a really good question. The the concern around data security, data privacy is real. And I mean, we we handle some of the most important data of our customers, which is really interesting because even before we had customers, we had to have attestation for SOC 2 compliance and make sure that we're having the right security, privacy, confidentiality, uh, controls in place so that we are protecting the customer data. Um, so that's something that we take very seriously, which is not just in the way that we implement security controls within Unit 21, but also in, in the HR operations of Unit 21. We conduct a background check, for example, for every employee that we hire. Uh, and the second question that you had is, like, how the score is a Boolean logic, so what can you do? And I completely agree with that. You know, the risk score is, it's not a new thing. You know, since 2010, every company says, I'll put machine learning and give you a better score. But as Alex said, that it does not really help you understand what is actually relevant for my company. What is interesting about the potential vectors of attack in my company? And if you can't learn that, then that score just becomes a blunt hammer, which effectively at some point it doesn't scale and then you just add more scores to the equation. So the core fundamental uh, utility that we see is in actually having an infrastructure layer where you have that ability to, to tap into the versatility of your data.